the, the Monster Show Equity Subcommittee. So excited to be here today. I'm going to take roll call. So from what I can see on the screen, Ashley Reynolds. Present. Nada Hashim. Present. Jeffrey Gallego. Present. Julio Thompson. Here. Good afternoon. We also have John O'Donnell taking notes for us. Susanna Davis. Great. And we have Julie from the Vermont Canada Control Board leading us in this conversation today. And is there anyone from the public? Um, we have both Bryn here and David Scher, also from the Canada Control Board, and then we have four members of the public. Hi, everyone. Um, so, our uh, agenda today is obviously we have no public comments, but I do want to remind everybody that they are able to go and see the public comments on to the Vermont Canada Control Board. Please, we want to hear from you. We do share this with our subcommittee group and do a summary for everyone to hear it. And then I'm going to approval and from Thursday. Has everybody had a chance to read that? Can I get a motion to approve? Thank you, Ashley. Will anyone second it? Thank you, Ashley. Not a second. Which brings us up to the important topic that we left off at. I hope you're ready for conversation because this was an important one, which is about business transfer. You know, can a social equity license business transfer to someone else? Um, and that's what we were talking about. And as I, as I explained before, a license is the business. They're going to, a social equity candidate is going to sell their business to someone else. How does that look uh, like? Now, we spoke about having the possibility of a social equity uh, business being transferred to another social equity business and having the time not restart, but um, it can happen. Is there an option to come on to their year center? Is there a year to the five? Or if they transfer to a non social equity license uh, within the five years, you know, since the first four is receiving benefits? that the new licensee will need to repay any cost savings the company has received through the social equity program. And then after five years, um, transfer of ownership is allowed without any penalty. Now there are things that we can also, we can change this. We can have for a social equity candidate, if a new social equity candidate um, comes on board, that they restart the time cost um, for themselves. For transferring to a non social equity license, you can have no penalties. So, really wanting to hear how everybody feels about this topic. Ashley, would you like to say that? Sure. Thanks, Tina. Um, I think sometimes I get a little bit bogged down in the language. I do like talking about it of selling your business. Um, I know that's how I think about things. That's business owner and myself is, is busy. I think it's important with, for anyone who's entering any business, um, cannabis or otherwise, to have a strategy of how they're going to either exit or have a legacy brand. Um, I think that this is really sensible. I think we should be with it as, you know, do we want to restrict anyone from their own personal gain out of the industry? I think it takes very unique individuals to want to get into this industry in and of itself, um, and then putting restrictions on them of when and how and who they can sell their business to, I think it's a bit silly and probably illegal. So um, I think I think that this, what you have proposed, is, is quite sensible. Um, can you go back again to what you said if um, a social equity uh, business 
sell their license to uh, another social equity um, licensee that the clock of the program starts over, meaning that then license holders fees would be waived for the first year and then so on and so forth. Can you just clarify that, Jan? Uh, right now, our recommendation is whatever the previous owner's fee schedule was. So if they're in the third year, then the new owner picks up that third year fee. Um, oh, right. okay. Instead of restarting the clock. But we can make a recommendation that the clock restart. Um, what we're trying to prevent in putting this statue in is to have say multiple people in an organization that might be social equity licensees to have one use the social equity licensee and then they have the ownership and then transfer the ownership to another social equity licensee, et cetera. Um, so, but happy to look at the fact of just having every social equity restart the clock. I mean, what are your feelings about sort of that time clock? Do you want them to pick it up where the previous owner left off or have them restart with each new candidate that comes on board if it would be a social equity candidate? I think I'm open to either. Again, you know, really looking at the season we are starting this program in the first place is, is getting as many involved that we possibly can with the least amount of barriers. Uh, again, this is on social equity to social equity, not social equity to a not social equity. So I'm, I'm yeah. open to those options. Okay, and transfer to a non social equity licensee. We think if you transfer within the first five years, the new owner should be repaying any cost savings that the company has received to the social equity program. The reason being is that the new owner would not have been entitled to those cost savings. How do you feel about that? I, I think that that's, I think that's a good, good stipulation. And then after five years, transfer of ownership is allowed without any penalty. I think that's fine. I mean, five years is a long time. Five years is more like 15 years in the Canada space, like dog years. <laughs> oh, I, I agree and with you. Yeah. We're going to check Hey, guys. Champlain Valley Dispensary that has um, series that attached to it, they have been in operation for five years, and they just sold their licenses for $25 million. So, like, you know, that was it's five years, but that was a long, hard, ground out five years. So I think after five years, you've earned the ability to do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for that. Great comments. Matter, how do you feel about this? I think let's go with this section A first. So transfer to another social equity business. Okay. So, so I, I, I like our current, um, idea right now with you know them adopting the previous owner's fee schedule um so i'm not 100 percent sure quite yet how i feel about the schedule restarting each time uh, because the business that they're buying isn't just any business it's a business that inherently already has the benefit um already wrapped into the business scheme the benefits of being a social equity having a social equity license uh, if that, I hope, hopefully that makes sense so you know I don't know if it would be I mean but, but at the same time I also want to make sure that we are opening the gates to as many people as possible uh, but also trying to avoid any exploitation of a license bouncing back between people in any organization um, in order to avoid uh, the fee schedule. So in summary, how I feel is you know, I prefer to keep it the way we have it now. Um, still on the fence about the idea of restarting uh, the fee schedule for each time it's transferred. Thank you. And about section B of a non-social equity license fee repaying the fee um, received for the social equity program. I agree with that. And are you okay with uh, after five years to transfer ownership is allowed without penalty? 
I would agree with that. Thank you. Leo, how, how are you feeling about this? Um, well, I'll start with the easier thing first, maybe. I think that the, um, you know, allowing transfer after five years without uh, any kind of payback, I think is fine. Um, I think that transfer to a non-social equity licensee, so then the payback, the prior subsidy, basically, that, that, that the state had provided, I think is fine. Um, and the question really for me is whether the purchaser, who is a, another, is a new social equity entrant into the marketplace, whether they would take over the fee schedule or be entitled to any kind of, <clears throat> I'm not saying that I, necessarily that it restarts the clock, but that there is any, any kind of subsidy, and, and by that I mean a break from the fees, for that first year um because i think that such purchases can happen if and i'm really talking about transfers to people who are unrelated that is people who are not family members or existing business partners so that you don't have that gamesmanship you're talking about my assumption is you're talking about an independent purchaser uh i, I would want to you know make sure we have as um, um, Ashley noted earlier that you would want to make sure that there's uh, incentives for um, so social equity players to remain in the market. Uh, so I'm inclined to have some kind of break for the first year of operation, either deferring it for a year, um, the payback, so maybe you do or assumption of the schedule, but for that first transition period, because one could purchase uh, a business that currently is failing, but might have assets that are valuable, which may or may not come to fruition. It might be a great location, branding, um, uh, or, or some combination of that, but for whatever reason, it could be cash flow issues that leads to debt that can't be managed, that um, the business is on a downward trajectory and so the original owner is selling to someone else and, and uh, where there's going to be uh, potential buyers, I would want to, uh, I would want to um, have, if the system be more, directed towards keeping, you know, that, that license in the social equity sphere. So, I mean, to that end, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't favor restarting the clock, but maybe having that first year when you buy a business and maybe you've got to bring in new employees, um, you have to deal with, you know, acquiring debt, et cetera, uh, I would want to have some sort of fee break. Um, I'm not fixed on a number like that, but, I'm inclined for that for that transition period for the the regu for the regulatory system the state to um, provide a, a a more friendly ground. But I'm interested in, in people's reactions to that. Well, I think that's a great idea. I think it gives us the balance that we want. So, with the transfer to another social equity business, if permitted, um, on. And yes. they would maybe get a 50% break, are you thinking? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in others' ideas. But that's the concept I'd like to kind of, you know, evaluate in the discussion that we're having today. And actually, I see our hand though. So. Um, I, would, I just wanted to kind of expand on that. Two scenarios, thinking about, let's say it's a bud tender that works at this social equity um, Dispensary, and they're seeing that they can run things and do things better than their boss. I mean, that's common in so many other industries. Um, but then, you know, we all know how difficult it is, like you said, for new employees or potentially renovating or, you know, changing something to the business if you are going to be acquiring it from your boss. What about starting whatever the year is that that? 
um, is in for the program, let's say, example, is that third year, um, it's just never a perfect timing of when you buy a business either. Could we, like, grandfather those um, fees into their start of their next year? You mean, like, the whole Right. Or so maybe, maybe we can reset the cost of the second year of the program regardless of when they receive this. So that would be a 75% deduction, not a full deduction. And since they are not, if it was a bus center, they would not be a partner of the business. So I think the relation putting that you are not a current partner of the business and or um, family member because then they would just continue the cycle. But if you were someone else, then we would go back to the second year, regardless of the time clock. Um, um, Susanna, I would love to hear your opinion. I think what I like the suggestions that I have heard. Um, I don't know that I have anything I want to modify. How do you feel about what we're talking about right now, that a transfer to another social equity program is permitted? However, the new social equity license starts from the second year of fee schedules, regardless of when the company was taken over, unless they are a business partner or a family member and they would have to take over where the previous owner's fee schedule was. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay, wonderful. So, I think we might be somewhere here. Um, so, how, um, Nada, how do you feel about that? About the caveats with the transfer to another social equity business? Yeah, I think those were, there were a lot of good ideas that were bounced around and I, I like the idea of just automatically going to year two if it's transferred to another social equity licensee. I support that. Thank you. So we are going to vote on this. Voting time, always fun time. Um, so I'm going to separate this into three sections. So our first one is about a transfer to a social equity business that's permitted. Um, However, the new social equity licensing will go back to the second year of fee schedule, regardless of the time period it was transferred, unless they are a current business partner or family member of the business. And they will then start as a previous owner's fee schedule, if that is the case. Ashley? Uh, I vote yes to that. Julio? I agree, yes. Nada? Yes. Okay. Then we're going to vote on B and C together. So a little bit easier. A transfer to a non social equity licensee within the first five years. Uh, the new licensee will need to repay any cost savings the company received the social equity program. Ashley? Yes. William? Yes. Nada? Yes. Nada? Sorry, uh, yes. William? Yes. And Ashley? Great, three yeses for the record um, for A, B, and C parts of this. I will update this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation to reflect all of this and I will add it as A, B, and C. And then our adjustments that we made to with A, so look forward to that later on today. And so we get to go on to benefits. This is where we get really inventive about the different ways that we really can support a social equity candidate. When we're discussing this, I want us to think beyond just a licensee holder. You know, yes, we want to help people get in and be able to own their own business, but we, we also want people um, 
to be able to be included within the cannabis industry. It's really important to make sure that social equity is throughout and not just as a licensee um, holder, and that may not be the best steps for many people to take in the beginning. Um, so I want to really try to focus on but a lot of these program benefits on education and how we can develop a person to understand cannabis and really thrive um, within their role and how we implement people into different levels of the cannabis program. So I'm going to start out by going over some um, social equity benefits. We've been doing comparisons of four different states. I'll go through those. Um, in Illinois, they have the licensing preference um, that we're spoken about, they get to be first in line, which we have already indicated we wanted for social equity licensees. Um, they receive training and technical assistance and business planning and applying for their candidate licenses. Um, they also have access to low interest loans. Um, in Massachusetts, um, they have a special um, licensees for social equity candidates only which is delivery and social consumption. Right now, social equity candidates are allowed to have this special license into 2024. At that time, they will readdress this, and it may be open to everyone. Um, they also have that licensing preference, and they receive training and technical assistance in management, recruitment, and employee training, accounting and sales, um, tax preparation and compliance, legal, compliance, um, business plans, best practices in the industry, um, assistance with raising funds or capital, and they also have access to low interest loans. Um, Michigan has licensing preference. They do a lot of online workshops uh, for technical assistance. They have one for applications. They have accounting um, and a couple other programs there. Uh, um, and then they um, just started a joint venture and password program, which is connecting the companies with people who are willing to do mentorships or incubator programs um, or to even facilitate employment as well. Um, and so this is a very new venture that they've created there. Um, going on what some of the social equity benefits are what we've seen in many different states. We're giving you that comparison analysis of all of the different state social equity programs out there. Um, they have a lot of the same, which is the priority licensing and processing, um, educational courses. One of the recommendations that I would really like to make is about having cannabis um, certificates. You can get certificates in cultivation, extraction, um, bud tender, about the business of, of cannabis. And these are things that can carry on with them. Um, and it is a certificate to help them. We also know with a lot of social equity candidates, they may not have that education um, due to various reasons of not being able to go in there. They might have been in prison during that time. So how do we get them on equal playing field as someone else? I think, you know, we should really look into cannabis certificates. Um, and there are programs out there that do provide certificate programs that Vermont can look into or Vermont creating uh, their own cannabis certificates with the rules and regulations along with sort of a baseline of industry requirements. Um, that we may want to look into. And also receive the training and technical assistance workshops in the following areas. You know, the applications assistance, um, business plan creation and operational development, tax, legal compliance, you know, industry best practices. One of the things that I think would be best and would allow us to use those resources of creating these workshops is to have them recorded and posted online. So we have multiple access, so we don't have to worry about um, do we have a classroom that they can all fit into, or how do we look at the numbers in order to include people. Um, if we have an online access to these things, more people can join. So we don't really have to limit the numbers um, if it's not um, in person. 
and then access to low interest loans, which I know we are looking at banks right now to see um, if that would be possible, and exclusive licenses, um, which is co-op, which we'll speak in a few minutes about, and delivery services. Nada, um, how do you feel about some of these options for social equity benefits? So I really like the idea of providing some educational courses um, regarding creating business plans, um, tax and legal compliance and best practices. Um, I think that would really uh, make people a lot more comfortable before they dive into trying to start a business um, in this industry. And I'm also thinking ahead to uh, legislators who may be who may not be in full support of what we're talking about here and the idea of cannabis certificates I think would satisfy some concerns that I'm just uh, formulating in my head that I think other um, other folks might end up having down the road so but I think cannabis certificates would be good in different areas um, and also making them accessible online instead of having a, you know, requiring people to get to a classroom setting, I think would also be a good idea because, you know, there, there's some communities where, you know, you, you can't, it, it, it's very hard to exist in Vermont without having a car. And there's, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking about folks who live far away from centers in which classrooms might end up. Um, other things. So I just think that we should offer this online as well. Very good point about transportational issues that they might run into. And are you okay with the other things, the access to low interest loan priority licensing and processing? Yes. Wonderful. And we'll discuss more in depth about these um, licenses in a few minutes. Julio, how do you feel? Um, I, I think uh, what what's been proposed is um, I think consistent with um, what we've identified is um, the sorts of assistance we would expect. Um, I, I know we haven't received public comments, I guess today, I'm, because I'm I'm not that familiar with the you know the starting blocks of the industry. I just don't know whether. We're covering all of the ground that, that uh, people who would want to enter the market would. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I would be interested in hearing that. But I, I agree, it's pretty, it's pretty broad, and um, some of them, are, to me, it's just it's obvious that would be helpful. Yeah, and I want to put this that this is sort of a, a, a basis of the workshops and classes that should be offered, but that they should not be limited to this, the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. And as the social equity program develops and any new workshop or educational material that can be provided does be provided. I think that this is just sort of, you know, a framework for now. Um, yeah, on the, on the topics that are identified here, the one that I would probably be the um, least knowledgeable would be the point about access to low interest loans. I don't know whether that means training about how to get that access or whether it means direct assistance. And so, you know, I'm a little uncertain about how to respond to that. But um, the rest of them, I think, are, you know, seem to me to be tough. I don't know. So that one would be direct access. Yeah, um, which we would try. I know the Vermont Cannabis Control Board is trying to look into right now. Probably um, outside of my area. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're still making sure that that is possible, but I think it is a strong recommendation that we should make to the board um, if it is possible. Ashley, what are your thoughts? Um, thanks, Gina. Um, I am not a lawyer, so let's preface this by saying that how do we define priority, like priority licensing and processing? They um, have expressed priority, so they would be moved to the front of the line. And I know that we're concerned with folks feeling, you know, 
it's always helpful to take a model from other states and uh, it's also nice to be bold and go beyond what other states are offering so i would encourage you to do this to do creatively as well thank you and you will see some creative juices flowing in that if we can get to those slides today that is definitely very vermont oriented um so i would like to vote on these social equity benefits um but not vote on the licensees with um, exclusive licenses or discuss those independently so nada how do you feel about the social equity benefits um that are listed here not including the exclusive licenses at this time Although, yes, probably. Thank you. Julio? Uh, with the understanding that this is a non-exclusive list, yeah, I agree. Yes. Thank you. And Ashley? Um, I agree with Julio that, yeah, as long as this is not this is it, um, I can vote with this, but I'd also like to know what that runway is. Um, for priority licensing and processing, which I'm sure we'll get into detail in. Well, we can discuss that um, right now. So it was just having a social equity candidate um, be able to be pushed to the front of the line. I understand that when the industry is in inception, but like a year from now, two years from now, I, I, I don't have the answer. I, how, how would that play into somebody who has had their license waiting for review for three years and then a social equity applicant then goes ahead and says, you know, I just, I don't know that much about how it all kind of works out and the hierarchy is established. I think we would have to speak to Vermont and say what they feel a priority licensing would be. Um, and hopefully someone's not waiting three years for a license. Um, but I do understand that because I, I have seen quite long on licensing uh, in other states but yeah i think we need to let them determine what priority means for them because we don't know the amount of applications uh, so i would let them determine what that means but that we are suggesting that priority licensing um and processing happens for these candidates so thank you we have um three guesses and i will make notes um, when we make these recommendations that this should be a starting point and that we should have follow-up and be looking at the workshop assistant courses that we offer um, to make sure that we are sufficiently helping a social equity um, licensee or just a social equity candidate in general. So now we go to exclusive licenses. I'm not sure if we want to make this a time limit on it do we want to say for the first three years um that we can have a co-op or a delivery license uh, for a social equity candidate so a delivery license is just a courier service for dispensaries you know you're allowed to deliver to customers um they already have this in the medicinal cannabis program it is not currently in the recreational guidelines so we would have to make this as a recommendation that they add delivery as a license and allow for delivery for um, recreational cannabis. Um, so I just want to let you know that we are just making this as a recommendation. That doesn't mean that it will happen. Um, one of the caveats I would like to say is that someone must have a reliable um, vehicle, um, a car with an alarm system, that it allows for GPS tracking device and that there is a way of locking the cannabis inside the car so that someone can gain access to it. I am not going to determine what that looks like, but making a guideline that, you know, the Vermont Cannabis Control Board looks at ways of creating this safety. One of the reasons for the delivery license is that this is an inexpensive way to get into the industry, um, which is um, sort of a concern for social equity licensees. So I am going to start with you, Julio, and how, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, 
I'm not sure yet. Um, so, I mean, these are um, things I hadn't thought about before uh, you brought them up today. So, um, so I, I have to think about it a little bit more. Sorry to say. Oh, that's fair enough. Um, and this is good because we're almost at the end of our time. So if we can just sort of Nada, how do you, how are you feeling on this one? Yeah, I think a delivery license is a good idea, but you know, in looking at this through a social equity lens, I think we're going to have to think a bit more about you know, the definition of a reliable vehicle with an alarm system and, you know, who, you know, I'm thinking about folks who may have cars that are a bit older because, you know, they don't they can't afford newer cars that have alarm systems or GPS tracking devices. I mean, uh, finding a way to lock the cannabis should be easy enough. But um, yeah, those are just my initial thoughts at first glance of looking at this. But I do like the idea of delivery licenses. Thank you. One of the reasons for those um, for alarm systems and GPS is that we also have to ensure the safety of Vermont's constituents. Um, and so I would not want, yes, it may cost them more to get their car up to date, um, but I don't want harm to occur um, if not um, having those things. But maybe, I mean, one of the things we can take away today is how can we do, have the safety elements maybe without those things if you um, want to think about those. Ashley? Um, I'm looking at the time here too, and I want to make sure there's time for a public comment. Um, I'm with Julio. I need a little bit more time. Um, I am in favor of delivery services for sure. I'm just a little bit confused on like that they're an independent contractor, and then they work with a bunch of different dispensaries to deliver the cannabis to homes, to other dispensaries. If there's co-op, is it? I guess it just a, a little, I need a little bit more framework as to like w what it really looks like, um, what a delivery service would really look like for Vermont, and who they would be servicing, and most importantly, how they would be protected. Um, as you know, from a business standpoint, I think about you know where I come from, insuring company vehicles that my employees then do delivery, you know, or do you know certain things that are surrounding the business. Um, and how involved that is just to have a company vehicle. So I'm rambling here, but um, I want to leave room here for public comment. But I need just a little bit more time, and I'm wondering what the NACD can bring um, for next week as far as like what are other states doing? Um, is it like an Uber driver type like business model? I guess I just I have a lot of questions about what it is in general. <laughs> Yeah, um, there are different models that are out there. One of sort of being a business like or owning a truck, um, which has it. Um, I was trying to make this as open ended as possible so that the Vermont Cannabis Control Board can really determine what is the best interest for Vermont without being so limited. Um, but we can bring you some models to sort of look at um, just to give you some more clarity or or ways that the Vermont Cannabis Control Board may may want to present it um, to the legislators. And Susanna, can, what, are, what are your thoughts? I have a question that we agree with, but um, what is the legal limit for window tints in Vermont? And if there is a limit in Vermont, can we permit these to be darker? Although maybe if we do, we're also signaling to people, hey, these windows are extra dark, this crowd is this, I don't know, just, just And that is a great question. Um, uh, would you know, Nader? Uh, yeah, you can't have any tints on the front windows. You can have tints on the back windows, but the front passenger and driver seats can't have any tints at all. Thank you for answering that question. And great ideas, great thoughts, and now we're going to open it up to public comment. Public comment? 
Um, good, please good put um, the person's name in the chat box. Um, I'll have to send it to you after Gina. I can't do that. I'm not able to do that at the moment, but I'll send it to you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Zachary Tyson. So I got a few comments. One, um, regarding priority review and processing, I think that is integral to a successful social equity uh, regulation. Two, you were mentioning um, application assistance. Who would be providing that assistance? Is it coming from the state? I mean, I know well-funded applicants, they hire companies all the time to uh, write their applications. So I'm just curious where that would be coming from. Three, um, I think there was a mention of a social equity general fund. Um, I don't know if that was in Act 164, but um, I'm curious, I've yet to really hear any discussion about that. And four, regarding delivery licenses, there's a company called Ease out of uh, California, I believe. I think they would be very beneficial for us to look at and see if, you know, how they handle it from there. So, kind of touched on a lot of topics there, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of, those are my comments for now. Hi everybody, I'm Ben Mervis. Thank you for uh, hearing me again and also for this meeting. Really excited at the vote so far and just want to second Zach's uh, statement about how helpful these benefits are going to be. Um, I'll keep things concise today and just say that we, uh, my, my business partner Craig Mitchell and I, uh, and as well as many people that we're speaking to within the community, are very interested in seeing social consumption also added to this list of exclusive exclusivity for social equity candidates. Um, particularly if you're already considering including delivery in the recommendation, which is not currently listed in the license types, um, we really think it would be important to consider consumption, uh, particularly because of the, when we talk about disproportionate impact on BIPOC communities, people of color, people impacted by the war on drugs, possession and consumption are the number one reasons for arrest. Um, just gonna remind you, it's about four times, if you're a person of color, you're about four times more likely to be arrested for one of those two activities than your white counterparts, and this goes up even more disproportionately in states that are less diverse, such as Vermont, uh, more rural parts of New York, they also saw that this went as high as 84% of arrests for people of color versus um, white people. Uh, so we'll ask you to consider that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comments? Yeah, Julie, Yep. Come back. Okay. Hi, everyone. Dave Silverman from Middlebury. Um, the uh, two quick things uh, on the, um, the scope of the technical assistance program that you're contemplating. Um, one thing that, that I think you, you could think about maybe long term is um, having technical assistance beyond direct industry jobs uh, to ancillary uh, fields. So for example, you provide technical assistance for folks on how to be HVAC installers, specifically in the cannabis industry. And that could help people, uh, you know, people who would fit into the equity applicant definition, but who are not actually applying for any equity licenses. Uh, but, you know, there are people who are trying to help um, get into ancillary fields, uh, not plant touching. So, you know, HVAC installers, contractors, accountants, uh, you know, you can really run the gamut. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that I think you could look at. Uh, in other words, you think about sort of like uh, helping folks with industry best practices, uh, it, it occurs to me you could do something really interesting with a sort of non-inspection um, farm visit role where you could uh, hire a, a, a person uh, who would go to farms and help people solve problems, uh, whether that be on site or even over Zoom. I think that's something that folks were, you know, would have liked in the in the hemp program early on, where you had crop failures due to issues that people who are not familiar with the cannabis plant weren't able to solve, but people who have a lot of familiarity with that plant would be able to easily solve. 
uh, and maybe that would be something that you could do, um, you know, specifically for equity uh, applicants. Um, that would help them get a, a leg up in the industry. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Senate for public comment. Thank you, thank you. Um, some of the things that were mentioned, um, we will be discussing, um, especially about the cannabis fund um, and the money there. Um, we will be getting to that next um, on our Thursday call. Um, so I, I do feel that that is really important. And one thing before we leave, I would like to discuss um, the co-op license for you to also, you know, leave away with this <clears throat> because this is a it's something that we're really going to have to talk about. And this is one license that is Vermont specific license. Um, this is not a model that I can pull from another state, uh, but this is a, something that I think it is really important. And as we said earlier, and someone mentioned, that there is a cannabis development fund, but it's very limited right now. There's 500,000 that's allocated to the fund. Um, and there is possible funds that might be added to it, which can be about additional 50,000 from each um, integrated licensee. But we're not sure how many of those licensees will actually come out yet. So right now we have to just deal with the fact that there's 500,000 and we're not sure exactly how many licensees, um, social equity licensees will be applied. So we see, and on top of that, all of the educational programs that we're setting out to be on and all of the expenses also needs to be paid from this 500000 So if we did a small loan for, for applicants, it would be very tiny. You know, we can be talking about five to 10000 or large loans, but it could be to very few applicants. Um, and as we know, the cannabis business is very expensive um, to maintain. And um, we don't want to set the social equity applicant up for failure. And one of the most important things is working together. Um, United is stronger, you know, dealing with the issues that maybe one person doesn't know how to deal with, um, but another person does may have that access. Um, and so that that would be the co-op licensee approach. Um, so a different approach to is to share the resources, to pull these resources together, and for the resources to be joined in order to purchase land and equipment to allow for a social equity candidate to work together and be able to go through all the you know seat sale chain and we all know that the most expensive thing right now is seed to sale like it is land and it is equipment um, much more expensive than just the application waiver that we can provide um, and the licensees. Um, and now we can think about maybe the social equity candidates may pay a small monthly rent to support the program um, and to pay for the land. Um, but I think we should consider this, you know, having the cultivation of process in South Canada, maybe someone having on site that can actually help them with this. Um, and this will work really well with the farm to consumer license um, that everyone has been speaking about and which would be very unique for Vermont to have. I'm just going to leave it there with you guys because it's a really important topic and you really need the time um, to think about what does that mean for Vermont and what does that mean for the funding that is available. And everyone who um, please come and join us next week to, for us to hear your public comments, but you can also put um, public comments online. Please go to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board website and let's hear your feedback from what we have to say today. And the community has done a great job. Thank you so much. And please review these um, few exclusive licenses that I've put forward. 
can I have a motion to adjourn?